So the doors are closed. I think that means it's time to get started. So I'm Egypt. I am one of the people who works on the Metasploit framework. Um, I also write a little bit of code for our commercial products, which are the thing that pays the bills. Uh, but most of my code is open source. Um, hello. <laughs> It's it's really really hot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like lemonade and urine and it's. <laughs> so if you're not familiar with the Metasploit framework. Um, I'm surprised that you're here, but thanks for coming anyway. Um, <laughs> it's a framework for not just using exploits, it's for building exploits, it's for making them better, faster, stronger. Um, it's a way for, or, or a, a, a tool for helping you make exploits more reliable, more flexible, um, so that you can use them with arbitrary pay payloads that we can provide. Um, it's also a place to keep all of your pen testing data. So all of the hosts that you've, you've compromised, um, all of that stuff goes in the database. You can look it up later. You can search it, et cetera. Um, so I don't want you, any of you, or anyone in the world to think that Metasploit is just for running exploits. That is one thing that it does among many. Um, it's also a scaffolding for building many other tools. So it's it's uh, an, a socket library. It's all kinds of things that help you make offensive tools because everyone loves shells and Metasploit is how you get there. Um, it's also open source security, which means we're sharing it with the world. We're making the world a better place, one shell at a time. Um, and this talk is intended to be just the changes in Metasploit over the last year or so, uh, some of the major features that I want to highlight that I think everyone should know about. Um, one of the, the most relevant changes for um, this presentation, not necessarily Metasploit, but, but the world in general, is that uh, Google Docs now allows animated GIFs in presentations. So here we go. First, I want to talk about some of the infrastructure and process changes that have happened, the, the, not the, the things that let you use Metasploit, but the way you get Metasploit and how you, you interact with Metasploit other than uh, sitting at MSF console. Um, so this is going to include like uh, um, things that make it easier for you to get Metasploit. Um, but um, in terms of like style and stuff, we've also made a couple of major changes. Um, ding dong, the tabs are dead. Um, Um, the committer who went through um, changing all of the tabs into spaces um, was set up by a Mr. Bids Beardsley, um, inconspicuously in the middle there. Um, and the avatar for that account is uh, a picture of John Wilkes Booth, um, and his name is Tab Assassin. Um, too soon? Um, so the next big thing is we're no longer using Redmine at all. It was the place for bugs. Um, now GitHub issues don't suck anymore. So we use GitHub issues for everything in, in addition to pull requests. Now they're integrated a lot better. Um, so now everything is happening in GitHub. 
Um, we're also using this cool thing called Travis, which is a, um, a continuous integration uh, platform cloud service thingy that lets you, like, if you've got a, a GitHub repository and you have tests, you can say, you can just put a, a .travis.yaml file in your uh, repository's directory and tell it to go look at that uh, repository and it'll build it for you and tell you if you have bugs in your tests. So a great way to determine if we've broken framework recently, which is a relatively good uh, random number generator. Um, so that we've also added a bunch of new repositories. Uh, these are the main ones. There are several others. Um, the ones on the, on the left here, data models, model concern, credential, are typically for um, the database layer of Metasploit sort of extracted so that you can see it all in one place. Um, the other things here, JSOPFU is a brand new as of last week, um, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, Recog, which we'll also talk about briefly. Um, and interpreter binaries, which is just a quick way for us to um, put binaries out there for the framework to use without having to commit, you know, eight megs worth of binary crap every time uh, we want to change the change interpreter. Um, and having binaries and source control kind of sucks, so this is a much better way of doing it. Um, so that's most of the like differences in process. Oh, I didn't talk about RubyCop. Um, RubyCop is this cool, um, it's a lexer and analyzer for Ruby that lets you um, determine if you're violating not only like syntax errors, but also style guide violations. Um, we don't use it yet in like every pull request, but it's a way for you to tell if we're going to bitch at you about style. Um, we also have MSF tidy for that, which is uh, super handy, and it's, it's much more accurate. RuboCop is really strict. Um, so use RuboCop, but beware that it's, it's really strict, and, and someday we'll come up with a great way to make it easier for you to use. Um, in the meantime, MSF tidy is your friend. Um, so the, I mentioned credentials earlier. Uh, we, they went through a major refactor. Um, it used to be just that we had usernames and passwords, and they were all one simple blob, and they could be associated with a service, but not really anything else. Um, now we've got a much more granular approach to how credentials are, are um, stored. We have publics, privates, and realms, which uh, generally map to publics are like usernames, uh, privates are passwords, but also sometimes SSH keys or uh, entail on hashes because they can be used as passwords. Uh, realms are um, a domain, a, uh, a Postgres database, things that are required for authentication but aren't a username or password. Um, and then we've separated it into two major categories. We've got a, a credential core, which is the combination of a public, a private, and a realm. Possibly some of those are missing, depending on the, the situation. Um, and a login is what ties that to an actual service. So you can have uh, a core username and password set um, that's not associated with anything, where you just typed it in and you think it'll work somewhere, and you can use that. Um, and we also have the concept of, of uh, tying those things to a service, which makes it a lot easier to, um, to rationalize what we can do with a credential, where it can go. Uh, it gives you a lot of flexibility, and all of this is in, uh, in active record, so it's super easy to query. Very, very useful stuff. So now I want to talk about Interpreter, uh, which is sort of the OJ show, um, the colonial. He's a, uh, he, Worked for us for a while at the beginning of the year, uh, end of last year, um, and since then has been contributing on the open source side. He's made a bunch of really amazing changes, um, not the least of which is that the, uh, the repository used to be kind of janky. It was all inside the Ruby repo. Now, as part of last year's push to uh, separate things out, um, that's all in its own re repository now. Um, but it used to be really difficult to compile. Um, and one does not simply download and compile an interpreter. Um, but OJ is a bulldog, and we sicked him on it, and now they do. <laughs> so basically now all you have to do is have Visual Studio installed, um, have Git installed on Windows, download, you clone the, the, Git, the interpreter repository, um, and run make and it works, does everything. Um, 
He also made a whole bunch of really important changes in terms of, of stability and, uh, and ease of use of looking at the code. Um, one of the things was that he made all of the errors go, or all, all of the warnings go away and then set uh, warnings to errors in the compile uh, build environment, which means now the code is a lot cleaner. Uh, there's less ugly scroll that you don't necessarily need or understand. Um, so when you build an interpreter, now it's all one simple script. Um, and when you're done, you get binaries that you put in data interpreter and it works. So much, much easier to contribute to Metasploit or to interpreter now. Um, so if you're, if you're interested in, in doing awesome payload stuff in, in C for Windows or for POSIX now, um, it's a lot easier. I highly recommend checking it out. Um, so there were some major crash problems with Metropiter for a while on 64-bit newer operating systems. Um, there, it turned out there was a bug where if a, um, if a pointer happens to fall in an ASLR range that didn't use the top bits, everything was fine. But if it happened to fall in an ASLR range where the top bits were set, they would get truncated and that pointer would no longer be valid and it would set fault, it would crash. Um, so OJ found one of these bugs which led to a crusade against pointer truncation um, and ended up fixing something like 35 of these things. So uh, much less crushy. Um, he also did a complete rewrite of the uh, POSIX scheduler, which was a big problem. Um, POSIX has uh, traditionally been fairly unstable, pretty crashy whenever you open up a, a TCP session with it, or a TCP um, connection through a, a routed interpreter, it would crash. Um, so POSIX has, has been pretty lame for a long time. Now with his changes, with his fixes, um, that's much less of a problem and, and POSIX interpreter is almost to the point where I'm willing to say stable. Um, he also added better thread management for both Windows and POSIX, which, uh, which turned out to be important for another crash in interpreter based on um, the webcam stuff. So sometimes when you would take a snapshot with the webcam, interpreter would just lose its mind. Um, it turns out that COM, which is the thing that interpreter uses to do the snapshot, has to be initialized and shut down in the same thread. If you do it in different threads, all bets are off. Um, so fixing the thread, ma thread management just made that problem go away, and now we have a much more stable webcam thingy too. The next big thing that OJ added is uh, direct support for Mimikatz and Kiwi. Um, Mimikatz, if for anyone unfamiliar, Mimikatz is the thing that, that lets you rifle through LSS's memory without having to inject anything into it. So in the, in the old way of doing things with the hash dump command um, or with FG dump or, or any of those, um, they would inject a small piece of shellcode into LSAS um, that would look around for the right things. Um, that's dangerous, as you might expect. Sometimes it would blue screen boxes. That sucks. So. Uh, Mimikatz just reads the memory. It doesn't execute anything in, in its process space. Um, there's a bunch of really great documentation about there about Mimikatz out there on the internet. I highly recommend you go look it up because Mimikatz is amazing. Um, there's now also the Kiwi extension, which is really Mimikatz 2.0, but we needed to keep the old Mimikatz because the new one doesn't work on XP in 2000. So the new one, Mimikatz 2.0, in Metasploit is called Kiwi. Uh, it's just a name difference, it's still the same code. Um, one of the big things that Kiwi gives us that we don't have in the old version of Mimikatz is uh, the golden ticket. And if you're not familiar with that, go look it up, it's amazing. Um, it also lets you steal LSA secrets natively. It's easy, it's one command. You just dump all of the LSA secrets. Um, and LSA secrets are sometimes passwords, sometimes not, but they're almost always interesting, at least. Uh, it's definitely worth your time to look at them. So this is just a quick help screen of the commands that you get. Um, just steal all the things. <laughs> That's really awful. Much better. 
Um, so this is the help from Mimikatz 2.0 or Kiwi, which g gives you more stuff. Um, it's it's got this nice little creds all command. So it does all of the other things. Very useful. Um, and you can get the same information just by load Kiwi and help. It's all right there. Because when you show someone's plain text, someone their plain text password, they drop their nuts. <laughs> the next big thing is um, Incognito v2, which has support for 2008 and newer operating systems. Um, that's the biggest change. It's also got uh, support for recognizing um, deny-only SIDs, which um, are a thing that are intended for facilitating UAC. Um, which would basically mean that you would see stuff that you thought you'd be able to use to escalate, but you couldn't actually use it. Um, now that stuff's not shown anymore, so good stuff. Um, next is the extended API. So up to this point, most of the interpreter changes have been like bug fixes and things like that. The extended API is uh, more new development, and it's intended to be um, all of the stuff that standard API doesn't really make sense for. So whereas standard API does like file system access where you always need file system stuff, you always want to be able to LS and CD, et cetera. Um, you don't necessarily always want to be able to query LDAP. But querying LDAP is awesome. Um, you also get service management, which is super useful. You can um, list all the services. You can... Um, look at a particular service and get information about it. You can start and stop services um, in all in a simple command. It's you know, very similar to sc.exe, um, but all in memory, and you never have to run a new ex executable for it. Super useful there. Um, Adsy. This one is very, very powerful, um, and I don't think it made as big a splash as it should have when we dropped this. Um, the, it gives you direct... Um, query access to the, uh, it's the Active Directory Service Information, System Information. Um, basically, you can query the domain controller for anything. Um, computers, you can filter on whatever you want. It's basically an LDAP query. You can, um, you can get these top two commands just give you, or, or the top one is computer enum. It just lists all the computers. User enum lists all the users. Um, domain query is the generic thing you can query whatever you want to query with it. Um, and that's really useful if you want to say, like, show me all of the servers. Show me all of the workstations. Um, show me all of the users who belong to the finance group. Very, very useful. And uh, clipboard management is another thing that Extended API does. And this is a fun party trick, um, being able to steal someone's uh, someone's uh, clipboard data. Setting their clipboard data is funny. <laughs> but that bottom one there, clipboard monitor, there's several commands in the, in the series. Clipboard monitor, it's like start, dump, etc. cetera. Um, that one is really, really useful for things like key pass and last pass, where someone is copy pasting a password well, in most situations, you're not going to be able to, like, steal that out of memory or, like, that shit's hard. Let's just get it from the clipboard. So, fuck yeah. <laughs> so that's all mostly been... Meterpreter stuff, primarily things done by by OJ, some of which um, were through ideas brought up by the community. Um, now I want to talk about um, browser exploits, browser exploitation, all of the interesting things that came about because of that. Um, between last year's DerbyCon, uh, the previous year's DerbyCon, and then there were 44 exploits. So I talked about how there were a shitload of browser exploits um, last year, and I had that same feeling like there were a bunch of browser exploits this year, but let's look at the, at the numbers. Last year there were 44, this year there were 17. So it felt like a lot, um, 
and the exploits covered wide ranges of versions, but the numbers were just not there. But there were more interesting things that we'll talk about in a second. Um, one thing that I want to point out, though, is that last year, of those 44 exploits, 11 were Java. At the end of last year, um, click to play became a thing. Now, a Java applet exploit has to get around um, click to play, or it's bas basically worthless. Because, well, at this point, Java applets are basically worthless. Um, Java added click to play, or Oracle added click to play to Java applets um, because they were getting pwned all the goddamn time. And now you've got this click thing that says big ugly security warning. Do you want to continue? And you say yes. But if you're going to do that, why use an exploit at all? Just use a signed applet. So there haven't, like nobody's been even looking because it doesn't matter anymore. Now we just use a signed applet. The fun thing about that is that a lot fewer people are using Java now. It's, yay. <laughs> we win. Um, so last year there were several zero days in the wild as well, uh, and not the least of which was the uh, Tor browser bundle exploit um, that the FBI used, so that was fun times. Um, there, were all, there were several in the wild exploits this year as well, but um, none quite so prominent as that one. Um, and this is basically ROP, right? You gotta bounce the ping pong ball off of all the little plates and hope it goes in the hole. Um, so browser exploit server is a new thing uh, intended to simplify exploits, uh, incorporating obfuscation um, and detection all in one place where you don't have to think about it as a module writer. You get all of the detection for free, you know um, that this is you know, IE 8 on Windows 7, etc. Um, and in that same vein, um, there's also been extensive work on ROPDB, which makes it easier for you to uh, produce ROP chains within Metasploit, or indeed elsewhere if you're so inclined, because it's a simple XML format. Um, so that stuff's fun. Um, but next I want to talk about obfuscation, which is like, man, that's a big scary van with guns coming off it, and oh no, it's an ice cream truck. So I mentioned the JS Opfu repo uh, earlier. That's brand new. It's basically um, another step in pulling things out of a uh, Metasploit framework that can be used independently. Um, JS Opfu now is just a command line tool and a Ruby library for parsing JavaScript and um, converting it into shit that's hard to read. So I hope this is readable to someone in the, in the back at least. Um, so JS Opfu is this just a simple command. The number we pass it here is how many times we run it back through the parser. Um, so we give it this simple little script that says this.console.log hello derbycon. Um, and that turns into this big pile of crap. Like you do that one time and it gives it gives you a, a balloon of about 2x and then it becomes exponential. So at if you do a JS Opfu 7, it's like 8K. Awesome. Um, so I talked about JavaScript OS detection in 2008, um, which was all fun and games, um, but it was difficult to use it in a real world scenario at that point. A lot has changed since then. Now it's all, like because of the browser exploit server, um, you get it all for free. Um, if you just include the mix in, um, it will tell you what the browser is, what operating system it's running on. Um, there's been a lot of updated uh, OS detections for newer operating systems. Um, we've added support for um, Flash, Silverlight, Office, and Java. And of course, Java makes sense because we were poning the hell out of Java before. Um, but Flash and Silverlight are, are interesting here because this year is the first remote exploit for Silverlight that I know of. Um, and so detection for it is very important. 
Um, we also also had quite a few flash bugs this year. Of those 17 that I mentioned earlier, four of them were flash. So good times. Um, and then the next thing is Firefox, which is a beast in and of itself. So Firefox has these really cool add-ons, which are basically JavaScript. Um, and it runs with this special SDK in this special environment. Um, and if you can execute JavaScript in the Chrome environment, you can install add-ons. If you can install add-ons, you get access to the Java Reflection API, which, hey, guess what? <laughs> Java is equivalent to an executable. So um, several exploits this year, there were there were two exploits that let you bypass um, the origin policy allowing you to run code in Chrome context. Um, there was the web IDL and two string console conversion. Um, do I have that? Yes, right there. Um, but my favorite one, like these are both, these are both amazing. They, they work from Firefox 15 through Firefox 27. Um, and there's like no indication that you're getting owned. It's just done. Awesome. Um, this one I love though, um, because I've, as I've mentioned before, my, my very favorite exploit class is things that aren't actually exploits. Um, Java signed applet is a perennial favorite. Um, I'm also a huge fan of anything that's, uh, code execution by design with authentication. Um, this is very similar to the Java signed applet. Um, in that it pops up a little thing saying, hey, do you want to install this add-on? And your add-on says, I need HTML5 rendering enhancements to be able to view our flashy, awesome page so you can get your dancing kittens. Um, and people will click OK. And then you get shells, and it's awesome. Almost possibly more important is Firefox lets, because it lets you run arbitrary JavaScript in Chrome context, running arbitrary uh, Java reflection APIs from there, we can run commands, we can do all kinds of things. We can also execute Java, uh, excuse me, JavaScript in the context of the browser as well. Um, so we've got these payloads here, which give you a Firefox shell, which is basically the uh, XPCOM um, calling back to you. Um, it's Super, super cool because it, it looks like a regular old shell, but you can also just inject JavaScript into it, which gives you things like this, where you can, from the uh, Firefox shell, you can inject, inject JavaScript that steals encrypted cookies, history, passwords, and you can even uh, XSS any site on the internet if you want. So you can inject JavaScript that would uh, um, steal all of your Gmail. So, super awesome stuff. Um, and this one is hilarious. Uh, webcam chat lets you pop up a like WebSocket uh, happy streaming webcam video chat with your victim. So, send somebody a phishing email and they click on the thing and then you get to talk to them and tell them how owned they are. slide intentionally left blank. Um, next is Android, and Android's been big. We've talked about it a lot. Um, it's, it's a fun space because it's so, uh, so much like the rest of the world, but still so different. Um, and this is one of the, the biggest and I think most uh, interesting things this year was the, the add JavaScript interface exploit. And Todd has talked about this extensively in lots of places, um, basically telling the world that, that this is really bad. Well, it really is bad. Um, there's still a whole bunch of, of uh, off-the-shelf devices that are vulnerable to this. Like, you go to Walmart, you buy a brand new phone, and it is vulnerable to this, and you can get popped just by going to a website from a Wi-Fi. Um, so JDuck published a, a man in the middle exploit for this. Um, uh, our own Joe Venix ported it to a, um, a generic browser exploit. So all you have to do is get them to come talk to you. Um, uh, and like I said, this gives you 
the uh, JavaScript execution in essentially the Chrome context of whatever browser is happening, um, which gives you access to Java Reflection APIs, which lets you run arbitrary Java. So now you can install um, any new APKs. You can um, run Meterpreter, Android Meterpreter, which is getting much better. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but we've also got this fun thing, um, the UXSS. And again, JavaScript didn't seem all that sexy not too long ago. But now, running, um, running JavaScript inside someone's Gmail frame is suddenly very interesting. Um, since this is a universal XSS, it lets you inject JavaScript into any site. Um, as long as you can make an iframe to that site, you win. So the, the fun demo for this was Rickrolling someone uh, by making their browser always go to the Rickroll. It's a good time. Uh, so in post-exploitation, we steal the kibble. Uh, Meterpreter now has new commands for stealing the SMS database, uh, for the call log, the contacts, and that's in addition to all of the previous capabilities like uh, webcam and mic access. So you can uh, you can take photos with uh, an Android device that you've compromised with Meterpreter using the add JavaScript interface exploit. So that's also lots of fun. Next thing completely unrelated to Android. Uh, printer job language. Um, anybody familiar with PJL? That guy. So back in the long, long ago, um, there was some, some fun talk about, about printer job language that lets you um, change the ready message on the screen. So instead of saying, you know, I'm ready, it'll say, feed me a kitten or whatever. Um, Well, our our own William Vu ported all of that work um, to Metasploit, but it also came up with some very fun things, including listing volumes, directories, and files. Um, so sometimes, depending on the on the model of a printer, sometimes it will store all of the things that you printed with it as like PostScript files or or whatever. Um, and that it's not always, but on some some models you can just go and download all of the things that they have printed, um, which can be very, very fun. Um, yes. There are a lot more fun things. Uh, I've got a link here. Um, I'll, I will have the slides available uh, later if you want to be able to click this instead of having to type it or Google it. And apparently I also have another blank slide. That's fun. Okay, so. Ready? Hack the planet. Woo! That's all the demo you're getting out of me. <laughs> Heartbleed. We did Heartbleed. We did it really hard. Um, how, many, how many modules did we end up with? Do you know, Todd? Three modules? We had a... Yeah, we had the, the key stealer the server module, yeah. Anyway, Heartbleed was lots of fun. Many things were stolen. Good times. <laughs> lots of people woke up from pagers. Um, now this, this I think is sort of the, the, uh, the killer of the year. This reverse hop HTTP is a thing Script Junkie did. Um, a very simple idea. You have a host that you can execute PHP on. So you upload a little script that lets you proxy stuff back and forth. Um, it doesn't always seem like that's the easiest way to go about things. Obviously, sometimes you, if you can just talk back directly to me, then great, that's awesome. Um, but doing it this way is really, really sexy. And I'll show you some networking diagram stuff here. So here we've got uh, a firewall that doesn't allow anything outbound. Um, this guy is an attacker. It's compromised this PHP web server. Um, and now we've got a problem. This guy has a host-based firewall. He only allows maybe one or two ports in. He's got some services that are available, but nothing else. 
So we can't use a bind connection. Um, so if we talk to him on that port that he's listening on, say he's another web server or a database server or something, um, we can't talk to any other port. So we can't use a bind payload for him to uh, listen and connect um, via this channel. Um, what we can do is we can have him call back to him and have him call back to us, but this firewall sort of prevents that. We can't have him call back to us. We can only talk to him through the firewall on that one port. And it gets even worse if he also cannot talk to the compromised guy in the middle except on one port. If he, can, if he only has port 80 open, everything else is firewalled, then you can't use a bind and you can't use a reverse. So in this scenario, there's not a good way to tunnel stuff back and forth until we have reverse PHP hop. And what this does is it sets up uh, basically a proxy on this compromised guy in the middle. And now every time, and it's all HTTP traffic, so this guy makes regular HTTP requests to a web server. That looks pretty normal. This guy, the attacker, also makes regular HTTP requests to this server. Everything looks completely normal on the wire. It's all just regular HTTP traffic. Um, but that little script funnels traffic back and forth and acts as a proxy. Um, this is, I think this is kind of revolutionary. This is awesome stuff. Um, and you end up with a scenario where a very difficult networking setup would cause you to lose shells, and now you can do your shell dance. So now I want to talk about some, some future stuff, things that we're going to be working on, things that I would like you to work on, um, mainly shell shock. So many logos. So many logos for shell shock. This, but seriously, this bug is going to be around for a long, long time. I know everyone else is going to rat on this too, but God, this bug. Uh, we're going to find this bug in places that no one ever thought bugs could be bugs. Um, it's going to be everywhere, it's going to be ubiquitous, it's going to live forever. Um, I've heard it compared to OIDA 67, I don't think it's going to be that. Um, I've heard it compared to Heartbleed, and it's like Heartbleed, but shells, fuck, come on. Um, yeah, so I, I really like this bug. And I also, I like these, I like these logos, they're cute. Like, like, and this one's, this one's fucking clever, man, it's got the bug in the logo. So future work, I want to talk about, or I want, I want to go forward with more credential stuff. There's lots more to be done, uh, lots more things um, that we can do now that we've got this, this infrastructure for, for dealing with credentials. Um, once you have things cracked, things stolen, um, and things guessed, you can, you can take that idea and I know all of these things fit together based on this user. Now we can look at users and not only compromised systems. So this gives us a lot of, of interesting data to mine for how, um, how to compromise a network, how a network was compromised, another way it could be compromised. So having this data would give you the idea of, I compromised this box, I compromised that box, I compromised this box using stuff I got from here. Well, if I got from here somewhere else, then you can show that I didn't need to get to this first box at all. I could have gotten here first. So I think that's really interesting data. There's uh, a lot of cool stuff that we can do with that, um, and that's definitely coming up. SMB2, 
it has been a thorn in our side for a long time. And this is technical debt that I've been, you know, it's been hanging over my head for a long time. SMB2 means that um, most of our Samba or our SMB stuff doesn't work. If you disable um, SMB1 entirely, which is possible in a reasonable uh, network where you don't have anything older than Vista, um, it is totally possible and totally reasonable to do that now after the end, end of life of, of XP. Um, and that breaks all kinds of stuff for us. Um, and not just us. Basically all of the, all of the tools that use SMB, uh, have a really hard time with SMB2. So that's something that needs to happen. That's going to, that's going to take some, some serious effort. Um, but it's something that just has to get done. Um, and in terms of future work, I think it's important to note that, that this question mark is you. Like, I want to do some things. There are some things that I want to do. I want to move Interpreter into uh, the client from Interpreter into the MSF namespace so that we can take advantage of database reporting. But all of that is kind of in the background that no one needs to really care about that except for me. I really care about it. I think it's cool. But no one else needs to care about that but me. There's something, something that you care about that you want to see in the Metasploit framework. And I want you to write it. So please, please give me some code. Um, I want to give some big thanks to especially these people. These are the top 10 uh, contributors by commit who don't work for Rapid7. Um, and I think this is really fucking important because open source contributors are key to Metasploit survival. Um, open source is not just a thing we do for fun. It's how we change the world. Uh, Metasploit is open source security intended to be uh, accessible to anyone and everyone. You can go out today and download Metasploit and I don't care how long you've been hacking. You can use Metasploit today if you've never heard of it. Um, that's powerful. And like I said, changing the world one shell at a time, these people make it possible. Um, many more also make it possible. I hope you will help us make it possible. Um, open source will save the world. Any questions? I'm out of gifts, so tenants is sad. <laughs> no, it's so bad. It's so bad. <laughs> So I lied, I do actually have more gifts. <laughs> please, please, sir, can I have another gift? Fine, I guess.